My name is Joe Watecki, and I completed a 20-year career in the Air Force uh, in 1988. I retired as a lieutenant colonel in the uh, spring of 1988. Uh, <clears throat> during that 20 years, I spent uh, a good, a sig substantial portion of, of my assignments within Strategic Air Command, the first part of my career, and um, uh, another substantial portion in Tactical Air Command. And uh, then I, I completed my career in the Pentagon at the Secretary of the Air Force level. Well, the, the event um, occurred very early uh, during my Air Force service. It was in uh, 1969, April of 1969, April 17th. Uh, if, if my uh, reflections and my logbook uh, help me accurately pinpoint that. I had just um, received my private pilot's license, in fact, the day before. On April 16th, I had successfully completed my private pilot check ride. And on the evening of April 17th, the next day, my instructor and I had a brief flight in the um, wholly contained within the traffic pattern at Loring Air Force Base in northern Maine. And the purpose of that flight was to give me a night certification check ride. So there was a solid overcast that night at 3,000 feet above gr uh, ground level, which gave us plenty of necessary altitude for the touch and go landings and maintaining VFR visual flight rules requirements. And we were landing to the south. Uh, there was a light breeze from the south. The runways at Loring were aligned uh, 190 degrees to the south and 010 degrees to the north, uh, north by east. And the breeze was, was fairly gentle, but it was uh, significant enough that we did have the, the south runway as active. With my instructor in the right seat and me flying the airplane from the left seat, the tower called us by our, our Cessna registration number and asked us if we had seen anything unusual north of the base. And that was, that was the way they posed the question, did you see anything unusual north of the base? I was pretty focused on the instruments and trying to impress my instructor with my ability to control the airplane uh, at night. But he had time on his hands, so he responded to the tower's call and said that, in fact, he had, on our previous pattern, um, seen a flash, a bright flash of light north of the base. Both my flight instructor and I were living on Loring Air Force Base at that time, so it was a, a matter of minutes to drive back into the housing area. So from the time um, we responded to that inquiry for t from the tower until the time we had driven back into the housing area and were getting out of the car, it was probably something in the area of 30 minutes. And as we got out of the car, my flight instructor was looking back to the northeast in the direction of the runway and said, what is that? I deleted an expletive, but what is that? And I, I looked up in the direction he was looking and he was looking in the sky over the runway. And what we saw <clears throat> were three very bright but independent lights, I, I mean three separate lights. We assumed they were independent. And they were in a perfect, um, uh, I, I, I guess, is a, I, equilateral, a, a perfect triangle, uh, triangular formation with the point south and the, the other two points of the triangle uh, directly behind it to the north. 
the, um, the curious thing about this formation of lights that caused us to watch it for an extended period of time, um, 10 or 15 minutes we watched it, was that first it was silent. Second, it was moving slowly, but in a perfectly constant altitude, perfectly constant velocity, and perfectly constant direction from north to south. We pieced together later, it was actually coming from the direction where uh, my flight instructor had uh, reported seeing the flash of light earlier. What was equally curious about this, since there was absolutely no noise associated, no sound whatsoever, associated with these lights, that they appeared to be drifting. But since they were traveling to the south, and having just landed the airplane within the previous half hour, we knew unequivocally that the wind direction was from the south, and anything drifting would have been moving in the opposite direction. So it, it, there was some propulsion. It was it was moving in a purposeful uh, manner, and um, we also knew because we had just landed that there was a solid three thousand foot overcast, and the lights that we were seeing were so brilliant that there was no way that they were in any way obscured by cloud or or any other. Atmospheric condition, so we knew that uh, that it was less than three thousand feet above the ground. weren't sure how far away it was, but it did appear to be over the runway, which, based on the formation of the lights, would have made made it very large if it had been a single um, craft ship. We agreed, after watching it with some fascination for that period of 10 minutes or so, that we had no idea what it was. But there was also not much we could do about it. And it wasn't until the next morning when I reported for duty, this would have now been the morning of April 18th, the first, uh, first duty I had each day was to report to a wing stand-up briefing in the wing command post. This was a strategic air command base. I don't think I specified that exactly. Um, uh, equipped with, um, as I recall, three squadrons of B-52s, two squadrons of KC-135s, and a squadron of F-106 um, fighter interceptors that were with what was in the Defense Command. When I arrived at the command post the next morning at about 6.30 in the morning, um, it was unusually active and unusually well-staffed. Um, in fact, it was a beehive of activity, and there were people that, who had obviously been there most of the night from their general appearance and, and, and um, apparent level of frustration. So I very quickly uh, learned that what, what had been occurring during the night was uh, began at about the time my flight instructor and I saw these lights. And it seems that these lights did position themselves over the alert force of B-52s over the alert pad where there were a specified number of B-52s um, configured for their wartime mission, should they be required to perform it. Therefore, there was uh, th this was a very sensitive area. I can I would prefer to just say that they were prepared to carry out their wartime mission. Um, And, and these lights were very interested in that wartime configuration, it would appear. So uh, this was the center of focus of, of the lights. They positioned themselves in that area. 
it was a typical training day for the 42nd bomb wing at Loring Air Force Base. And there were a lot of aircraft sorties returning to base that night from their daily training missions and that sort of thing. Um, and as, as sorties returned, I was told by those who had been there overnight, uh, they were asked to close and try to identify, close with and try to identify these lights. And um, this included B-52s, KC-135s, and even some of the F-106 interceptors that had been out doing their particular training missions as well. And the pattern was the same each time a, a, an aircraft would approach. The lights would depart in ways that defied any aerodynamic knowledge that anybody there had or could explain. Such as? Just rapid acceleration, rapid uh, changes in direction, uh, including vertical, and uh, just doing things that uh, something that is flying by the rules of aerodynamics that we understand would, would not have been at all possible. Always to return to their point of interest, which was the aircraft power. And then at some point, late in the night, early in the morning, uh, their curiosity was satisfied and they, uh, they took off very expeditiously in a straight line and we're gone. I would be guessing how many hours uh, this took, this whole event uh, took from beginning to end, but uh, it was certainly probably in the, um, in the range of six and, and, and perhaps more hours duration. And I filed it away, and, and I just mused about it, and I, I discussed it with a few people over the years, not too many, um, until a day in the, early in, in the 1990s, I, I forget the, the, the exact year and date, but it was um, about 93 or 94, that I had occasion to attend a lecture by Dr. Stephen Greer in Hampton, Virginia, and um, saw a photograph of what I now understand is a very familiar uh, sighting among those who have been privileged to actually see a UFO. Um, and learned at that time, and when I saw the photograph, I, I literally jumped out of my seat, grabbed my wife by the hand, and I said, that's it. That is exactly what I had seen over nearly 25 years ago at that point. But to see that picture just brought back the image so strikingly clear that there was no doubt in my mind that that was exactly what we had seen over the runway in April of 1969. And it was only then only then that I had any notion that it was in fact a single uh, machine, not three independent uh, machines. But I will deduce with some degree of knowledge that they must have been because of the repeated attempts of returning aircraft to close with them uh, from distances and altitudes where they couldn't have acquired them visually because of the low ceiling that night. So I would deduce from that fact that um, they were being tracked on ra radar, both ground uh, control radar and airborne radar on the, uh, the aircraft that were returning to base. It would be a very reasonable a deduction to say that they were uh, easily being tracked on radar. 
Well, I was the public information officer at that time. So I can say um, with a high degree of certainty that there was no public statement regarding the incident. I'm sure that SAC was involved real time as it was happening and if there were radar tapes uh, perhaps the, uh, there was a, a record of the events in that regard as well as I'm sure classified message treatment. <clears throat> I do remember very clearly that no no aggressive action was taken by the Air Force, by anybody at the wing, uh, in response to the lights because they themselves did in fact show no aggressive or threatening behavior whatsoever. They were simply in airspace that was uh, restricted airspace, but, but they were not doing anything that would prompt any sort of a, a security response. But upon reflection, and in retrospect, it is curious how quickly that's, that subject just was dropped. It just wasn't discussed. It, it very clearly, having seen the photograph that is part of your presentation, uh, I know exactly what it was. It is what you have photographs of uh, from many different locations at many different times. It was the triangular, very large uh, ship. It's bigger than a conventional plane over the Oh, absolutely. That's why I was so surprised when I saw the photograph to learn that, that those lights, which were so far apart, could conceivably be part of a single machine. And why I naturally assumed and for all those years believed I had seen three separate um, machines and I, I assumed operating independently although their formation was so perfect that in retrospect clearly uh, there was no reason to assume they were three except that it, for, for them to be part of one unit it would have to have been so enormously large compared to anything. And, and at that time, uh, B-52s were considered pretty big airplanes, and they, this, of course, dwarfed anything that would have been part of a B-52. And we heard a voice come on, uh, very excited, say, yelling that God was here, it was the end of the world. And we looked at each other and thought, well, that's strange, what's going on there? Uh, another few seconds went by, and another voice came on, more controlled, uh, this person said that uh, there's a there's something over the ship is what he said there's something over the ship